Good evening and welcome to session four of the IJR Press Workshop. And we will uh, begin where we um, Shall we start? start last time. The, uh, Dr. Goyal will be talking about ethical misconduct in publishing. Over to Dr. Goyal. Hi, good evening, friends. Um, today we enter the last leg of our journey on this workshop. And uh, trust me, it's been an enjoyable journey so far, walking along uh, with the team. So here, um, let me present a little bit more about scientific misconduct. Once again, welcome to the session. Hello, friends. In this session on scientific misconduct, I'm going to talk about a few things. Data fabrication, falsification, plagiarism, a bit about photo manipulation, duplicate publications, and conflict of interest. So without further ado, let's dive in into fabrication. So what happens uh, in fabrication, which is also called dry labbing, you make up either results, recordings, or report results which were not there. And uh, sometimes people introduce unusual or unreal references to suggest that these are actually authentic results. So you find suddenly that the data is not there, the deadlines are nearing, you need to submit, and you're not sure what next to do. And then you make up the results, you make up the data, you fabricate data. A different kind of misconduct is about data falsification, where you have some data, but there is an attempt to present fictitious or distorted data. It could be data, it could be evidence, it could be references, citations, experimental results, and or you might be knowingly using such material without uh, actually saying that this is so. People manipulate equipment or research materials or processes and even misinterpret the results by sometimes ignoring the outliers or not admitting that some data is missing and they don't include data on the side effects of a clinical trial. All these would fall under falsification. So you have the data, but you don't find the results that you were trying to get or Sometimes you want to please your supervisor or your thesis guide, and you find that the results are not coming out exactly the way that the guide would be happy with. And then you change those data points just to get the right kind of results. That, friends, is data falsification. So obviously, I'm not going to tell you that it's wrong to falsify and it's wrong to fabricate. But let's go into another territory of plagiarism. So plagiarism has got an entire spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum, you might find that there is an unreferenced use of references, or I mean unreferenced use of previously published or unpublished ideas. And at the other end, there is a entire spectrum which transcends through to the other end of the spectrum, where you have the entire submission of a previously published paper in another name, or just change the name of the author and publish it yourself. So everything in between lies under plagiarism. It could be the copying of ideas, processes, results of words without giving appropriate credit. And it's also a subset of it, which is the citation plagiarism, where you willfully forget or you have a negligent failure to appropriately credit the other person or someone who's done this work before you, just to give uh, an improper sense of priority or preference or importance to yourself. This is also called citation amnesia or disregard syndrome or even bibliographic negligence. There are different kinds of plagiarism. 
the most common uh, mistake that we all commit is kind of cut and paste. There's something called patchwork, where you borrow phrases and clauses from the original source, and without putting them into quotation marks or citing the other author, pass it off as your own work. Then people fall for paraphrasing, where you summarize without citing the source. You just change one word here and there using synonyms, but retain the essential thoughts, sentence, or structure, or style. Most of the times, this is unintentional. So all these things could be done inten unintentionally. And then there is something called self-plagiarism. Self-plagiarism is when you copy without citing from a paper in your own name or your own work in the past and then pass it off as your work again in the future. Now, why would self-plagiarism be a problem? So as uh, in the last session we talked about, Copyright. So self-plagiarism is an important aspect which violates the copyright of the individual. So once you have published with a publisher or another individual, you may no longer hold the copyright. And once you plagiarize from your own self or from an article which you had written yourself, then it definitely violates the copyright which lies with someone else and you have landed yourself into infringement of copyrights. So how do you avoid plagiarism? The first and the most important thing that you need to be careful about is the intention. If the intention is right, most of the other things will always fall into place. So intentional plagiarism is definitely, definitely, definitely to be avoided. Before you do a work or before you start writing, please ensure that this is your own work. There are several tips that I would like to share with you by the way of which you can avoid unintentional plagiarism. And this is very simple. It's not rocket science. Tip number one, do not copy and paste. So even if you are writing from another paper or if you want to quote from another paper, we have a common uh, instinct. We would copy from somewhere else and paste it into our own article and change the formatting. That's it. It's so simple. However, that's not what you want to do. Please forget copy and paste exists on your computer and please restate and type in your own words. A lot of us are uncomfortable in typing and that's why we adopt the easy route of copying and pasting from another source. But no, please type it back in your own words. That's first tip to avoid plagiarism. Number two, Keep track of the sources that you have consulted and an easy way to do it is to use a referencing software in which you cite where, while you write. That means you cite as you go along. You put in the bibliography and citations as you are writing and do not leave it for later. If you leave it for later, you are bound to miss some of the citations and you would forget where you picked this up from. So it's always, always better to use a referencing software, a reference manager software, like I spoke in one of the previous sessions, and you cite as you write. Tip number three, paraphrase and write your own ideas. It, it follows from the first one, where you do not copy and paste, and you restate things in your own words, and you would paraphrase and add your own ideas. So if you quote from another source, Please give credit wherever it is due. Please do not feel shy of giving credit or acknowledging another worker or another researcher who's done this and said this before you. If you are quoting from a review article, if you have read a systematic review and you would want to quote one of the studies which is included in that review article, please remember this is not a good idea. You should be crediting the original author or the original study, and you should not be citing secondary references. The primary reference is that particular author and that original study. It's not this review article. So you also always need to credit the original author and the text of your article and also in the reference list. And finally, you should always use a plagiarism check software. But please also remember 
that once you use a plague flag check software or a plagiarism checking software, you get a false sense of security, which is not required. The most important thing is that your intention needs to be correct. And if your intention is correct, do not copy and paste. Use a reference manager software and cite as you write. And do not quote from a review article. Go back to the original study and quote from there. And finally, use a plagiarism check software. So this is the most important slide in my today's presentation. And I have delved on this at greater length and spent the most amount of time in the entire presentation on this particular slide. Because I realized that a lot of young authors fall into this trap and find it easy to get into this trap. And then it's always so difficult to get out of it once you've fallen into it. So here is a list of uh, some free and some paid plagiarism software that are available out there. And you could use any one of them. And this is not a comprehensive list. And there are several other softwares that are available. And you could use practically any one of them. One question that we are often asked is, what is the usual cutoff? How much should the black check software identify? Or what is the usual cutoff which will be taken? So there is no such cutoff. However, I have taken this from one of the journals, which says that if the black check software flags about 15%, we would accept it, anything under 15%. If it's between 16 to 30%, we would invite the authors to revise. If it's between 31 to 50%, we would outrightly reject the article. And if the plagiarism check software flags more than 50% of the material, then we reject. And we also ask the authors for an explanation why they submitted to this manuscript, uh, this journal, and why they had so much of a plagiarism in their article. So please be careful. These are only indicative cutoffs and they are definitely not the thumb rule and they're not uh, followed by all journals across the board. The most important is your intention. So there's a fine line which separates plagiarism and copyright infringement, which is uh, as we discussed in the previous session also, plagiarism is when you don't say where you took it from, whereas copyright infringement is when you take it without permission. And it happens to be this purple area of intersection when you take it without permission and try to pass it off as your own work. At this point, I would like to bring in something like uh, the license for use. So what uh, we often tend to do is that we would do a Google search. Supposing we are trying to make a presentation, we would do a Google search and we uh, find different images and we would copy those images into our presentation. For example, I have copied this image here which says Creative Commons or CC into my presentation. Now, this could be a copyright infringement or this could be plagiarism. However, when you search for Google under the tools, you would find that there are different kinds of licenses which are associated with each image or each file. There are some which are labeled for non-commercial use. There are some which are labeled for non-commercial reuse with modification. There are some which are labeled for reuse and some which are labeled for reuse with modification. <coughs> so when you are using images of Google, please remember that you need to check what license it has been listed under and follow only those which are labeled for non-commercial reuse or reuse with modification, depending upon how you want to use that image so that you do not fall into this copyright trap. Okay, the next topic we're going to talk about is photo manipulation and I would finish this um, in a couple of minutes. I can see the frowns on um, the organizers' faces because I'm exceeding my time, but another two minutes and I'll wind this up. So in the recent times, there has been an increased usage of photo editing software. But please remember when you are using images, manipulation is not permitted for the following, following things. You cannot splice together different images to represent a single experiment. You can change brightness and contrast if you are changing the entire image's contrast and brightness. 
but you can't change the contrast and brightness of only one part of the image so as to modify the signal intensity and give an impression of a different uh, image than what was actually recorded in the experiment. If you are showing only a very small part of the photo so that additional information is not visible, that is not acceptable. Any change that conceals information, even when it is considered to be non-specific, is not acceptable in, in many journals. So please be careful while you are taking pictures of clinical material for presentation or for use in your articles. A word on duplicate publications. So duplication is uh, when you try to republish the same findings or you try to submit one to one or more journals simultaneously or it might be salami publications. So as you would see, this is a picture which shows what is a salami. So if you divide one research project into many small papers, that again is not considered good science and good scientific practice and is something that you definitely want to avoid in early parts of your careers. And finally, a word about conflict of interest. So to define it, it's professional judgment concerning the primary interest of the study, which relates to the validity of the study. So if your professional judgment concerning the primary interest of study comes in conflict or is unduly influenced by the secondary interest, by another secondary interest, such as a financial gain, or it may be anything that may just give that impression. So anything under this gamut comes into conflict of interest. And anything, remember, which if revealed to the reader later, which, may, which will make a reasonable reader feel misled or deceived will all come under conflict of interest and you do not want to give that impression. It's not necessary that conflict of interest may be financial. It could be personal, it could be political, it could be academic, it could be commercial, or it could be personal. So please remember that you need to carefully analyze your conflict of interest, understand that the validity of study is not affected by either a personal, commercial, political, academic, or financial gain, which could lead to a conflict of interest for yourself. And with this, I would come to the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you for your patient attention. And um, over to Dr. Lapika. Thank you, Dr. Goel, for the lovely talk.